Hello, everyone. Good afternoon or good morning um, and aloha. I'm here to um, introduce Dr. Daniel Wagner, who's the chief scientist of Ocean Exploration Trust, a nonprofit which is one of five key members of NOAA's Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute, or OECI. Um, along with Ocean Exploration Trust, OECI is headquartered at the University of Rhode Island and includes partners at University of New Hampshire, University of Southern Mississippi, uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And we're really excited about all of the work coming up this summer. Uh, Dan's here to talk to you today about community-based exploration and the EV Nautilus's 2023 season overview. Um, a lot of this is in collaboration with the Office of Ocean Exploration and Research here at NOAA, and we're excited for Dan to be able to talk to all of you about what's coming up, as well as how you can be involved. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Wagner. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Aurora, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, so as Aurora mentioned, I'm the Chief Scientist for the Ocean Exploration Trust, and we're just about a couple of weeks from the start of a very exciting uh, field season aboard the uh, exploration vessel Nautilus. And I'll take you through a little bit about uh, each and every one of our expeditions, as well as some background ex information about our principles of operations. Uh, but just to take a, a couple of steps back, um, uh, you know, there's an increasing awareness now within our population that we live on a largely ocean planet. Uh, over you know, close to three quarters of our planet is covered by the oceans. Uh, but despite this, uh, I think there's still within the large, larger population, there's a lack of awareness how much of this is, is really in deep waters and far offshore waters and completely unexplored. Even if we look at you know, the best quality maps that we have, uh, only about 20% of the seafloor has been mapped with, with modern technologies that are able to resolve smaller features uh, and the bigger part, you know, over 80% of it, is, is in these dark areas there where we really have little, very little information about what the seafloor looks like uh, and let alone what lives on it and what kind of features we have. Uh, in fact, with modern technologies like submersibles, we've only imaged less than about a, a fraction of a percent. Uh, and so the, the vast majority of this big part of our blue planet is, is completely unknown and unexplored. Um, and that's a really a problem to a lot of things, not just to scientists, but resource management. Um, that we, we really lack some of the basic information that, that is needed. Um, and you know, exploration has therefore a lot of benefits. Uh, it's very difficult to manage an, an ecosystem or a planet where you have very little information, um, big planetary processes like nutrient cycling or climate processes. Uh, they're really difficult to understand and model and predict when you only have information about you know, 1% of what that big ocean looks like. Uh, it is also uh, exploration of these dark blue areas has a lot of imp implications and benefits for resource management, fishery management, or conservation. Um, and it also has a lot of uh, applied uh, uses, um, you know, biotechnology and medicines. Uh, there's a lot of new products coming out of uh, exploratory missions. Uh, in fact, the, the rate of new um, drug discovery is, is uh, two to three times higher on marine products than there are in terrestrial products. And exploration is also a really important catalyst for uh, technologies, the development of new technologies. Uh, and so there's a lot of reasons why we explore and the benefits of it. Uh, but there's also some of more fundamental processes and what I like to think of uh, exploration is, is one of the few things that we have that, that brings together people from different backgrounds, different ages, different um, knowledge systems, and we all look together in amazement and say, wow, I did not know that included. And that's a really big part of what we do at the Ocean Exploration Trust, is we try to use exploration as a vehicle to bring together uh, different scientific disciplines, different knowledge bases, uh, and people from completely different backgrounds to, to work together on a, on this mission of exploring the great unknown. Uh, and that brings us to, to what we do. Uh, as Aurora mentioned, we are a nonprofit, uh, and our mission statement is, is really about exploring the, the ocean to seek out new discoveries while bringing together uh, different partners uh, to push the boundaries of technological innovation and, and STEM education. 
So, uh, so our big pillars are you know, science, technology, and education. Um, we own and operate the exploration vessel Nautilus. This is a 220-foot four uh, state-of-the-art research vessel that is equipped with a whole suite of different technologies uh, to map and explore the oceans. Uh, so EB Nautilus is equipped with a, a suite of uh, sonars. So these are acoustic systems, uh, uh, several of which that are mounted on the hull uh, of, the, of the vessel. Uh, and these are able to uh, pulse uh, a, an acoustic signal that is then able to, to create these really high uh, quality maps of the seafloor and add to the, the, to the 20% of, of the seafloor that we have uh, uh, just mapped. In addition, the, the vessel is equipped with uh, several remotely operated vehicles that are equipped with a whole suite of different cameras and sensors uh, and manipulators and other equipment to collect samples. Um, these are remotely operated vehicles, so they are not uh, crewed, so nobody is sitting in them, uh, but they are uh, controlled from the ship by this large tether here that you can see on the bottom of the screen. Uh, and so people on the ship uh, basically control and maneuver uh, these vehicles and are, are able to collect samples as well as video um, and other environmental data. A another wonderful thing about the exploration of Nautilus is that big dome there towards the, the back of the ship. Uh, so this is our VSAT that is uh, basically connects the ship uh, via high uh, bandwidth internet. Uh, and this is a really wonderful tool that basically allows us to share the images, the video, the data that we collect from the seafloor in near real time with basically anyone that has access to an internet connection. Uh, so uh, you know, I showed you the screen there of what it looks like in the control van on the ship where the pilots and scientists control the mission, uh, but anyone with a, with a good internet connection can basically uh, mirror that same setup and is able to see uh, exactly what the pilots and scientists see on board um, and this is a, a wonderful tool that allows us to expand our scientific capacities. So uh, we, we do not just rely on the, a couple dozen of scientists that are able to sail on its mission, but are able to leverage the, the intellectual capacity of, of folks around the world that can participate in our expeditions, help guide and plan and execute them. Uh, and this is just a, a wonderful tool that allows us to do science in a, big, a much more collaborative way. In addition to uh, a science tool, uh, this telepresence technology and this ability to connect uh, with global audiences is also a wonderful tool uh, for education and outreach. Uh, and so we're also able to live stream um, our videos and our observations and our data to basically anyone uh, that is interested and is able to join in the excitement of discovery. Uh, in, in terms of our, our science priorities, uh, uh, these are just some, some general uh, priorities in terms of what we're uh, seeking to do, uh, both this year as well as previous years. Uh, so uh, a big part of our expeditions this year is funded by NOAA Ocean Exploration uh, and through the Cooperative Institute. Uh, and so we're really an extension of their priorities, which is to map and explore uh, unsurveyed areas in the U.S. exclusive economic zone. Uh, as well as to integrate uh, emerging technologies into our operations. Uh, so I already talked about the remotely operated vehicles and our um, mapping sonars that are really the bread and butter of what we do. Uh, but we're also progressively using other technologies, including autonomous vehicles, uh, landers, um, profilers, and various other tools to expand our exploration footprint. Uh, and now the fourth bullet there, this is really important. Uh, if we do community-based exploration, and we also try to uh, prioritize the science needs of the geographies that we operate in, uh, and not just the geographies that we operate in, but the communities that are tied to those places. Uh, so there's this common misconception that when you work in offshore areas where nobody lives, that these places are not important to people, uh, but that can't be farther from the truth, especially in many places in the Pacific where there's been people connected to these remote places uh, for millennia. Uh, publicly accessible data is also a really pillar of what we do and how we operate. Uh, so we, we realize that we, we are very privileged to get to go to some of these places that are uh, very far uh, and where it's hard to get to. 
Uh, and so we try to make sure that we everything that we collect uh, is, is archived in a way that anyone can access it in perpetuity. Um, and this is really important because uh, we want to really stimulate follow-on uh, explorations with our operations. And then the last thing I alluded to there, uh, you know, interdisciplinary and collaborative work is really what we seek to do. Uh, so on every one of our expedition, we don't just sail with engineers and scientists and technical experts, but we'll also have students, um, educators, uh, as well as folks from cultural practitioners uh, and from other backgrounds, because we really uh, believe that by having folks from having different perspectives and different backgrounds working together in one environment, uh, that you get a much more holistic view uh, of, of, of the whole. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, the, our, our, what I like to call the exploration journey. Now, most of the webinar today is, is really focused on talking about uh, the, our season ahead and each one of the explorations, so the second box right here. Uh, but I think it's really important to understand that this is part of a larger uh, journey uh, that includes several steps, uh, including uh, pretty uh, rigorous planning uh, for these expeditions that starts many months to years in advance. Uh, then we go through some archiving and analysis of, of the da data that is collected after every mission. Uh, and then we also do uh, some uh, uh, a few publications put out uh, it's to add some value to the large amount of data that is collected uh, so that folks can then uh, have an easier way to find uh, the data they're looking for. Uh, important thing is that each one of these uh, each one of these steps in the process is community driven um, and so there is we, we solicit input at every one of these uh, places uh, and there's also a lot of discovery that happen and happens on each one of these steps. So let's start with this first step, so our, our science planning. Uh, so once we have a, a good idea of where we are going to be operating in the year ahead, uh, we'll start our community uh, planning process. Uh, this, in essence, involves uh, meetings with stakeholders, so, so meeting with uh, resource managers that are, uh, that are tied to a particular area. Uh, and then we also put out a call for science input. These are forms. Uh, that are circulated broadly with the resource uh, management and the scientific community uh, where everyone can provide input in terms of uh, specific areas they believe are important to map, uh, explore via ROV, uh, specific samples that should be collected, um, and also uh, identify themselves as an expert for a particular field uh, that we can then tap in later as we uh, start refining our mission plans. Uh, so we then take all this input that is collected uh, via meetings as well as via these forms uh, and then really distill this down into several documents that I'll share with you uh, after the webinar. Uh, but we put out uh, just an expeditions overview that provides uh, basically a, just a quick snapshot of, of the expeditions that we're planning uh, for this season. This is typically uh, done about a, a, a year ahead. Uh, and then we also put out a, a pretty detailed expedition plan uh, closer, about two months before its mission, uh, that has a lot more detail about it, every one of the missions in terms of where they're going, what their priorities are, um, and uh, what typical operations will look like. Uh, we then uh, take these expedition plans uh, and circulate those with the community. Uh, we typically have a, a science planning uh, webinar that is uh, done about one to two months prior to an expedition. And in fact, our first one of these webinars will be held tomorrow and we'll also share the link after the webinar. Uh, and these are basically a, a time where we just share the draft plan of the expedition uh, and then also use that as a way to solicit further input uh, for our expeditions. Uh, we then take uh, all that information and finalize our cruise plan, which we take into the field. Uh, but uh, as many of you know that do field work, uh, Mother Nature and other factors will sometimes uh, interfere with what your plan, uh, but we stay in communications with our scientists ashore uh, and uh, basically seek uh, to continually uh, provide uh, updates about what we're doing and also solicit input as, as plans change. Uh, now I just wanted to uh, shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit about uh, our expedition uh, season this year. 
Uh, so we're just uh, a couple of weeks away from the start of, of this very jam-packed uh, season that will take uh, eight months where the EV Nautilus will uh, transverse several thousand miles of open ocean habitats in the central and eastern Pacific. Uh, important to note that these expeditions are funded uh, mostly by no ocean exploration through the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute, uh, but we've also have uh, some uh, additional funding and, and other expeditions that are funded through Ocean Networks Canada, uh, the Office of Naval Research, and the Bureau of Ocean Energy uh, Management. In terms of just broad um, objectives, um, it, it's important to note that our expeditions kind of fall in, into several major uh, categories. Uh, so we're about a week away from starting what we typically refer to as our shakedown expedition. So we'll have two back-to-back -back expeditions uh, where we'll basically just go out uh, and test uh, our systems, make sure that all of our mapping, ROV, uh, telepresence systems are, are ready for, for the season. Uh, and then in starting in mid-May, we'll have our first ROV expedition and we'll have several others uh, throughout the season. Uh, then we'll have a few expeditions that are really dedicated to uh, mapping, uh, where we'll um, seafloor mapping will the main uh, impetus and main driver. Uh, we'll also have one expedition where we uh, uh, completely change our mode of operations and uh, put away our, our mapping and ROV systems and bring on board several uncrewed uh, systems and autonomous systems, the profilers, landers, whatnot, put it all on the ship. Uh, and then there, we also have a couple of other expeditions uh, here in gold uh, that are funded by outside NOAA Ocean Exploration where we are, will be uh, having a, a very dedicated uh, task at hand. Uh, just in, in broad views, um, now these, these expeditions will be uh, exploring some of the most exciting places in the Central and Eastern Pacific. Uh, these are just some of the major themes. Uh, so we'll be exploring uh, many seamounts across the, uh, across the Pacific and, and really uh, areas of seamounts where we expect, expect to find interesting biology, uh, some very uh, high dense uh, covered uh, seafloor communities. Uh, we'll also have several dives on hydrothermal vents, both off British Columbia as well as above the Hawaiian hotspot. Uh, we'll definitely uh, hit some really interesting geological formations, uh, particularly in the Pacific Islands remote um, Marine National Monument, uh, and then we're also excited that we'll uh, have several dives uh, on archaeological sites uh, associated with uh, the Battle of Midway and the Pearl Harbor attack. In terms of our technologies, I uh, already talked about the mapping and ROV systems, uh, but these are just a few of the additional uh, um, technologies that we'll be integrating into our missions. Uh, most of these will be integrated during the, our, our multi-vehicle uh, expedition that I'll talk about later, uh, but others will be uh, integrated piecemeal and, and as part of, uh, of ROV and mapping expeditions. Uh, so we'll be including our the uncrewed surface vehicle uh, DRIX, operated by the University of New Hampshire. Uh, this is an uncrewed uh, surface vehicle that is equipped with a mapping uh, sonar as well as a whole suite of other sensors. Uh, we'll be bringing DRIX on several of our missions. Uh, and this is a, a really wonderful tool that basically acts as a second ship. Uh, so you can have you know, Nautilus mapping in one area and then Drix uh, in another area, and then basically uh, doubling the area that can be uh, mapped at one time. Uh, we'll also be bringing the, uh, the Mesobot. Uh, this is a, an autonomous vehicle uh, operated by Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Uh, that is really optimized for exploring the water column. Uh, so most of our operations have traditionally focused on, on just exploring the, the seafloor. Uh, and I've mentioned that uh, you know, less than a, a fraction of a percent has been imaged on the seafloor. But if you think about the three-dimensional uh, nature of the ocean, uh, that the biggest part of the ocean is really the water column. And that's just a tremendous untapped resource that is completely unknown. Uh, and so we'll be bringing Mesobot on one of our expeditions uh, to uh, do some basic exploration in the water column. Uh, then we also will be bringing uh, this instrument in the bottom left panel. Uh, this is a, a deep 
autonomous profiler uh, developed by the University of Rhode Island. Um, it, it is, a, in essence, um, equipped with uh, several environmental sensors, CTDO, as well as uh, video cameras. Uh, and this piece of equipment can be left on the sea floor uh, for over a day. Uh, so uh, that's a, it's a really powerful tool in not just getting a snapshot uh, of a few minutes when you're a seafloor, but, but able to leave things, instruments on the seafloor and, and get uh, a bit more uh, time series data of, of what uh, actually happens in these environments as time changes. Um, then we'll also, on our first ROV expedition, we'll be bringing this instrument in the bottom um, middle. Uh, this is a uh, Raman spectrometer uh, developed by our partners at Impossible Sensing with input from many uh, academic and government institutions. Uh, this is a uh, instrument that will be mounted on our ROV, uh, and it is in a spectrometer. Uh, and this is it's a wonderful first step at basically uh, getting around the problem of having to collect many samples. Uh, so this instrument via, via lasers is able to tell us a lot about what we're looking at without having to collect a sample. Uh, we we'll, can tell you something about the chemical composition, uh, molecular composition, and other properties of, of the environment you're, you're looking at. Uh, and we'll be basically be testing several areas, comparing uh, the data that we collect with the instrument to actual physical samples that we collect um, and then last but certainly not least, we'll be uh, integrating uh, the HADL profiler developed by partners at the University uh, of uh, Hawaii. Uh, and this will be brought on our shakedown expeditions. So this is our profiler that was developed for, for, for work in trenches, so uh, down to HADL depths, uh, and is able to collect a whole suite of environmental uh, data uh, throughout the water column. So uh, I, I'd like to shift gears here once again, and just I'm going to give a, a brief overview of, of each one of the main objectives of the upcoming expeditions. Uh, towards the end of this uh, webinar, uh, we'll share a couple links. So there's a, a document that also summarizes a lot of the information that I'm uh, that I'm telling you. Uh, I'll be showing here several maps, uh, uh, a couple of things they'll be showing you. Uh, it, in these maps basically show uh, in gray and white colors areas that have previously been mapped and explored. Um, and then uh, other areas are shown in, in more bright colors. And these are the target areas of, of these upcoming expeditions. Uh, so the, the first uh, expedition will be going to uh, the Kingman and Palmyra unit of the Pacific uh, Remote Islands Marine National Monument. Uh, this expedition will start in mid May and will take us uh, about a month. Uh, and we'll be exploring with our remotely operated vehicles areas primarily located north of the boundaries of the Pacific Island, Remote Islands Marine National Monument. Um, there's several seamounts in that area that have never been explored. So you can, all these white dots are previous ROV dives, uh, basically all the previous explorations in that area. And many of the mapping have happened inside the monument, but the areas outside of it that are within the U.S. exclusive economic zone are completely uh, unmapped and uncharacterized, uh, and we'll seek to collect critical baseline information to add uh, to this large unknown. Um, as I mentioned previously, this expedition will also include uh, the, the Raman spectrometer, uh, and we'll be testing this, uh, its performance uh, in terms of what it can tell us about uh, the substrate uh, without us having to collect uh, samples. Um, it, it we'll expect to have about 15 or so ROV dives, mostly targeting depths about 200 to 4,000 meters, um, integrating that Raman spectrometer on, on those dives that are shallower than 1,500 meters. Uh, and a big part of this uh, expedition is really to acquire data that supports the, the management needs and the science needs of the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument uh, to this very large marine protected area. Uh, is currently undergoing the process of developing a management plan. Uh, so we're working closely with partners uh, both at NOAA and Fish and Wildlife to collect data that goes into that process. After uh, this expedition, we'll uh, shift gears um, and shift operations too. Uh, so we'll have two expeditions basically uh, focused on mapping that basically will bring the ship from the Central Pacific uh, out to British Columbia and back. 
so these are two expeditions, uh, not consecutively, but uh, in that period of mid-June to late July, where we'll have 21 days out at sea. Uh, and this is really focused on seafloor mapping, basically bringing the ship from Honolulu to Sydney and British Columbia. Uh, here again, I'm showing publicly existing uh, mapping data here in these gray colors. And we'll basically choose uh, transit routes that will go over these blue areas that have uh, never been mapped before. Um, so these are, uh, in addition to bringing the ship there, um, we'll also have a few days uh, uh, in support of uh, work by NOAA Ocean Exploration. Uh, we'll be conducting a, a mapping calibration exercise, uh, basically going over uh, an area where several ships will be conducting the similar exercise uh, so that we can compare data collected by different oceanographic uh, vessels. Uh, after that, uh, we'll have uh, an expedition funded by Ocean Networks Canada, a uh, very complete mode of operations to what we traditionally do. Uh, this is in support of the cabled observatory of British Columbia. Uh, so there's a, a, a cabled system that really connects uh, various uh, equip sampling equipment and sensors across over 800 kilometers of fiber optic cable. Uh, and we'll basically be going to many of these stations and deploying sensors and equipment, uh, as well as doing some ROB dives to uh, support maintenance uh, of the uh, cabled observa observatory. Uh, and important uh, to, to note here is that these, this cabled observatory is, is really a, a, a fundamental different way of exploring. Uh, so a lot of our exploration is ship-based exploration where you go out with a ship uh, and then basically you're out there at a, at a very specified uh, mode in time. Uh, but by having a, a, an observatory out there that's able to collect data 365 days uh, throughout the year, uh, you're really able to collect more data on, uh, on, the, on how things change over time. Uh, after that, uh, and then the, after the shift comes back to the Central Pacific, uh, we'll have a, a, a couple of expeditions uh, with our ROV. Uh, the first is uh, going back to the Pacific Islands Remote Marine National Monument uh, and specifically to the Johnston um, unit of the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument. Uh, and we'll be using ROVs as well as the uncrewed surface vehicle Drix uh, to spend uh, most of the time of this expedition towards the northern extent of the monument, an area that where we have very little information. So uh, big gaps here in terms of mapping coverage uh, and even bigger cap, uh, gaps in terms of what we have uh, surveyed with remotely operated vehicles. Uh, so we'll be uh, using Drix and EV Nautilus, um, hopefully sim simultaneously to map uh, these large mapping gaps and then also deploying the ROV probably about a dozen or so times uh, to explore several seamounts in that area at depths about 2,000 to 3,500. Um, meters. Uh, after that, in September, uh, we will um, bring uh, the EV Nautilus out to the northwestern extent of the Hawaiian archipelago, uh, which currently encompasses the uh, Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. Uh, so another very large marine protected area that protects the, the, the three, um, the northwestern extent uh, of the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, and this uh, expedition will mostly focus on our ROV dives. Um, uh, important to note here is that we uh, will uh, conduct about 15 or so ROV dives, uh, mostly uh, in this blue polygon here towards the northwestern extent, which is completely unmapped uh, and uncharacterized. Only a couple of ROV dives were done there last year, really huge gaps in terms of what has been mapped. Uh, there's several seamounts in this area that are of unknown geological uh, age, and so we, we will collect samples there to understand the geological context of the uh, region better, uh, as well as to seek uh, to characterize many of these seamount communities uh, where we know uh, there's a lot of life on them. Uh, last but not least, uh, this area here, this blue box is also uh, uh, the site that, uh, that was witness to one of the most pivotal uh, moments of uh, World War II history. Uh, so the Battle of Midway was one of the most uh, influential events of, 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 of uh, 
uh, of World War II. And while most of the battle uh, happened directly around uh, Midway, close to shore, a big part of that uh, battle hop happened 100 miles offshore, uh, where several uh, large vessels were sunk. Uh, and so we, we hope to uh, uh, explore these, these underwater cultural heritage sites for the very first time. Uh, then uh, in October, we'll have uh, yet again a, a complete different flavor of, of operations. So during 18 Downs at Sea, uh, we'll bring the ship out to the geologist seamounts, this purple box right here, uh, located south of the Hawaiian archipelago. Uh, we'll be bringing several of these different tools that I spoke about earlier. Uh, so this will include uncrewed surface vehicle DRIX, so this red vehicle, the Mesobot, and yellow here that will explore the the, the, the midwater column, and they'll also will be bringing uh, uh, the lander, the deep autonomous lander. Uh, and the idea here is that we'll work with these three vehicles in tandem, uh, then uh, deploy these, these systems simultaneously uh, and collaboratively uh, to um, um, explore uh, this area. Uh, important to note is that this is the third iteration of the multi-vehicle exploration. So we've had these yearly expeditions uh, every every year once. Uh, and so uh, most of our, our last two years have really been more of technology demonstrations. Uh, and this year we're, we're hoping to, to transition into more of a uh, operational approach to basically now that we've done a lot of the the initial testing uh, is, is really going to an operational phase and using all of these technologies in, in tandem. Um, then in no, late October to November, we'll have a completely different um, uh, focus. Uh, so this is an expedition uh, funded by the Office of Naval Research. Uh, and we'll be basically integrating a new wide field camera ar uh, array system. So this camera shown here, uh, in the picture on top left, um, we'll be for the very first time integrating this uh, camera onto our ROVs. Uh, so this is a wide field camera array, so it's able to capture um, the imagery in a, in a, a three-dimensional sense and, and get you a much wider field of view. Uh, and we'll be uh, bringing uh, this, uh, the, our ROVs to some of the most complex terrain that is found around the uh, Hawaiian archipelago. Uh, several of these uh, steep pinnacles, ridges, uh, the Hawaiian hotspot, uh, submarine canyons. Um, and the, the idea is really is to test how this camera system can, can operate in, in some of the most dramatic and stunning terrain that we have around the Hawaiian archipelago. Uh, in addition to that technology, we'll also be integrating uh, for the first time, hopefully in, in, in real time and in the field, an artificial intelligence software uh, to basically help us annotate the large volume of, of video data that we collect on, on our missions. Uh, uh, then in November, uh, we'll have a, a, another mapping expedition. Uh, this is funded both by NOAA Ocean Exploration and the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Uh, focus on this, on this blue crescent here, south of the Hawaiian archipelago, uh, where we have large gaps in terms of the mapping coverage. Uh, so we'll be using the, the sonars on EV Mount Nautilus to mapping these large gaps in mapping coverage that we have. Uh, and in addition to those um, mapping surveys, we'll also be deploying this, the Deep Autonomous Profiler uh, to collect um, you know, video data of, of seafloor and select areas, as well as water data for, for eDNA. Um, so uh, to, to basically support baseline characterizations of these, these areas that have, have never really been explored. Uh, and then our last expedition of the season uh, will be in, uh, just before Thanksgiving and ending just before Christmas, uh, which will be a, a mapping expedition that will bring uh, EV Nautilus to one of the most poorly mapped areas in the entire United States, uh, Jarvis Island, uh, located uh, south of Kingman and Palmyra, uh, where you know, we, and with the exception of a few transit mapping lines, we have basically most of that area has, has not been mapped, uh, and we'll spend uh, about a month in that area trying to uh, map uh, and cover as much area in those large gaps. 
so I, I want to sh change gift, uh, sh uh, change gears once again, um, and just uh, talk a little bit about how each and every one of you can participate um, in uh, the the excitement of discovery in these expeditions. Uh, so the one thing to 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 really take away from this webinar, if there's one thing, uh, is to really bookmark our website. Uh, this is a, a wonderful gate, gateway for a whole suite of information, uh, including real-time access to, to our video streams, uh, as well as a lot of educational and uh, materials, highlight videos. Uh, so yeah, if you haven't checked out our website, uh, it's an important one to bookmark there. Uh, so when we are out at sea, um, and uh, anyone can go on our landing page and basically we'll have uh, our, uh, a link here to our, our YouTube channel and you'll be able to see exactly what's happening as we're out there. If the ROVs are in the water, you'll be able to have near real-time uh, feeds of, of what the ROVs are exploring. Uh, if we're mapping, you'll, you'll see uh, basically feeds of, of um, what the seafloor looks like and from the, from the acquisition of the sonar data. Uh, and in other expeditions, uh, you'll, you'll have access to topside cameras. Um, it'll also give you a little bit of uh, stats in terms of you know, what we're doing and where we are. Um, and uh, every one of these expeditions uh, will have a, a dedicated landing page, or will you be able to dive in deeper into uh, the background of those expeditions? Uh, so this is just you know, available to anyone. Uh, so you know, anyone that is interested to learning more and just listening in and seeing what's happening uh, is invited to do so with our website. Uh, but for those that want to dive in deeper uh, and want to participate more actively in terms of helping plan and execute two missions, we have our Scientists Ashore program. Uh, so this will give you access to higher uh, latency uh, and uh, video data, uh, it will give you access to a lot more of our data streams, uh, it will add you to our uh, listserv, so you'll be able to obtain daily um, reports of what's happening out there and, and write-ups of what we're planning for the next day. You also get access to uh, various uh, two-way communications uh, channels, so you'll be able to communicate directly with scientists on the ship, uh, and they will provide your input. And well, we'll after this webinar, we'll, we'll share uh, a link to so where, where you can sign up uh, as a scientist ashore. Uh, this is just um, a kind of a, uh, an overview of what you'll be obtaining. So once you sign up for, for a, as a scientist ashore, uh, you can select what expeditions you want to do that for. Uh, and that basically you'll, on a daily basis, obtain uh, a short one to two page documents that describes what we're planning. Uh, what we are uh, hoping to do the next day. Um, and uh, it will also give you access to our OET uh, science portal. Uh, so this is basically where you'll be able to obtain more than just the, the video feeds. Uh, you'll obtain you know, access to maps and real-time maps of where the ROVs are and what we're doing. We'll have access to uh, a whole suite of different data streams, basically any 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 data stream that people on the ship can see, you can uh, you can pull up through this portal, uh, and it will also give you access to our chat that uh, provides you an know, opportunity to directly communicate with scientists and shore. Uh, and this is really important if you, for example, have a specific interest in a specific sample that would be of value to your research, uh, something that might be new or exciting. Uh, as you see it uh, across the, the, the video feeds, you can then connect directly to the scientists on board and ask them to slow down and get some more video and potentially samples uh, of things that are of interest. Uh, a few things, um, I mentioned this earlier, a big part of our, uh, our pillar is to make all data publicly accessible. Uh, so with the exception of a few things where there's sensitive data that might be protected under federal law, uh, all of our data is publicly archived and, and made available to anyone. Uh, so all of our video data is currently being locked through our YouTube channels where you can not just access real-time data, but also access past expeditions and, and, and uh, look at uh, you know, the whole dives uh, it, that were done um, in the past. All of our mapping and our environmental data is currently locked at the Roland Deck uh, repository in the Marine Geosciences Data System. Um, 
and then in the, in the marine geoscience data system, we also have uh, a whole suite of our um, uh, our, our, our uh, documentation data in terms of the dive reports. Um, then our samples are archived also in publicly available places. The geology samples are archived at the Marine Geological Samples Laboratory at the University of Rhode Island. Um, this um, has uh, also has wonderful facilities, so all the rocks come back and are archived there. They do some uh, analysis there um, and then put them in their repositories. Uh, there's th different portals that you can access through uh, their website, so you can see exactly what was collected. You can request samples on loan, and you can also go visit uh, their facilities to uh, study samples there. Similarly, our biological samples are, 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 are all archived at the Harvard University Museum of Comparative Zoology. Um, you can also there, uh, through their portal, access metadata of every single sample that we have collected to date. Uh, you can request samples on loan, uh, and you can also uh, apply to fellowships, and they will actually uh, fly you out to, uh, to, the, to the museum if you're a, a scientist of the, with a specific expertise and want to spend some time there uh, to work in their archives. Then uh, on our website, there's a whole suite of information of, of, on our expeditions, so including highlight imagery um, and highlight videos, which are really uh, the creme de la creme. So for every one of our expeditions, our, our very talented education and outreach team uh, produces these, these very nice clips summarizing the, the, the highlights of an expedition. Uh, that's all of our Nautilus Live website. And then uh, important to mention is that in addition to all these archives where data is uh, archived and is really accessible by, by anyone, uh, if you have trouble finding it, uh, you can also um, request all of our data upon request. Um, we'll basically then take a look at that and uh, uh, send you links to where data is, is stored. Um, and if it's not yet available through any of these archives because there's a backlog, uh, we will uh, share the, the specific data with you. In terms of uh, next uh, steps, um, for those of you who have a specific expertise or a specific interest to participate uh, in our dozen or so expeditions this year, uh, we'll share a couple of links here after the webinar. Um, one is you know, all of what I've mentioned to you on this webinar is also uh, captured and summarized in our expedition overview document that we'll, we'll share the link uh, that provides the up-to-date information what we're planning on each and one of these expeditions. Uh, and then we'll also share uh, the link to sign up as a scientist as sure. Uh, this basically uh, adds you to the mailing list for an expedition, so you'll get daily update, updates of, uh, of the expeditions that you sign up for. It will also give you access to our science portal to basically all the data that is collected. Um, and then the last thing is uh, for those that are interested uh, in diving even deeper, uh, we encourage you to participate very actively in the planning process of, of our, our expeditions, the first of which is actually kicking off tomorrow. So we'll have our first planning webinar tomorrow to plan our expedition to Kingman on Palmyra, where we'll share the draft cruise plan uh, and invite everyone to to provide input there um, to make sure that this addresses the needs of the broader scientific community. And then I just wanted to to finish off, uh, and I talked here a lot about our our science priorities and what we do in terms of you know, scientific and technology. Uh, but uh, you now a big part of our mission is obviously also the education and outreach piece. Uh, so again. Um, Flying the flag, our website is a wonderful gateway to a whole suite of information uh, and tools that can be used to, to for education and outreach purposes. Um, and this is really really important part of what we do at the Ocean Exploration Trust, um, communicating what we do uh, and why we do it uh, to reach the broader world is really a big part of, of every one of our missions. Uh, so uh, on every one of our expeditions this year, we're, we're very proud uh, an honor to be able to offer science and engineering internships um, so and mapping internships. So we'll be sailing with, with interns um, on every one of our expeditions. Uh, we also will be sailing with communication fellows. So these are science educators, professional educators that will sail on our missions 
uh, and help uh, really be the MCs. So help um, moderate the, the conversations in the control van, ask questions, field questions from uh, people on shore, um, and help uh, that the conversation uh, really addresses uh, the interest of you know, anyone uh, that is uh, interested in ocean explorations. We also have what we call live ship to shore interactions. So if you happen to be a, a, a teacher or work at an, a, uh, an aquarium or any facility where you wanna engage your audiences with what we're doing on the ship, you can uh, schedule these live ship to shore interactions. And this is basically a, a Zoom or Google Meet call with the ship uh, where you can have a direct conversation with the scientists on board uh, and they will then sh you know, be able to share a little bit about their experiences of what, what's happening on that mission. Um, there's also a whole suite of uh, K through 12 educational resources, all linked through our website, uh, curricula, classroom activities, whatnot is all uh, on our website. Um, talked about our website, uh, social media. So we're also available on all of your uh, favorite social media um, channels, Facebook, LinkedIn, TikTok, um, and all the others. Uh, so for those of you who are interested in that, uh, encourage us to, to follow us. Uh, and then we also produce uh, more detailed media on every one of our expeditions. I, I talked about the highlight videos uh, that are produced for, on our missions that really capture the, the essence uh, of, of, of what we're doing on, on every mission. Uh, these are just uh, a few of the communication fellows and in, interns that sailed with us in, in, in the past. Uh, and these are really important parts of our, of our program. And with that, uh, I'd like to thank all of you for, for taking the time uh, to, to, to learn a little bit about our plans ahead. Uh, I'll ask Katie to share with you a couple of the links that I, I mentioned. Uh, so this include links to our expeditions overview, uh, links to our how to sign, sign up as our a scientist ashore, uh, as well as uh, a link to sign up for the planning webinar that is happening tomorrow, the first of which uh, we will plan the operations of our Kingman and Palmyra. And then uh, if we have 10 minutes, I'd be happy to address any questions. And if I don't get to your questions, uh, do not hesitate to reach out. You can always reach us at, at science at oet.org. And with that, uh, thanks so much. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Daniel. Really exciting to hear about all the cruises that are coming up this year. And I'm sure you're going to find amazing stuff. We can't wait to follow along. Um, we do have some questions that came in the chat box here, in the question box, excuse me. Um, the first one asks, which expedition will include the Mezabot? That is the multi-vehicle um, exploration. So this is uh, it's starting in uh, October. Great, I think it's NA155 for those of you who wanna follow along on the website. Um, the next question is, will there be a recording of this webinar available or a one-pager of links and resources? Uh, yes, the, the webinar is recorded and, and should be uh, shared, I believe, tomorrow, uh, Katie mentioned, uh, so for anyone. Um, and then we also have very similar material on our website. Um, so if, if you just bookmark the links that Katie shared with it, uh, yeah, all, all of this um, is, is archived. Great. Um, and then the last question that's in the box here is more of a comment and says, I attended the Jason project in high school, and I guess that helped influence my career, which is the kind of stories we love to hear. Yeah, and I mean, that, that just warms our heart to, to hear this. Uh, and, and this is really, I think, a, a big part of, you know, uh, for us that have been, had the privilege to go out there, um, you know, you, you realize that these, 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 it's really a privilege um, to get it to go out there. And so we feel responsibility to share those, those experiences with, with the public at large. Because uh, you know, I, I personally believe that if people were able to see the things that we see and experience the things we experience, they'd probably go about their day-to-day -day life in a different way, uh, understand the impacts we might have on these remote places. So yeah, that, that's really heartwarming to hear. I have a question. Uh, 
I wanted to know, um, so how big is the Nautilus actually, and how many uh, staff or crew are, are going to be on these uh, this expedition? Are they on it the whole time? Are you swapping out crew continually? Uh, I'm curious. Yeah, th thanks for that question. So EV Nautilus is 220 foot uh, feet long. Um, and it has a space for about 50 uh, people. And typically what we have about um, you know, 33 or so are our mission personnel. So these are folks that come for a specific mission. So these are the scientists, engineers, educators, interns, um, and then the other 17 or so are crew. Uh, so the officers that, that steer the ship, the engineers that take care of it and the uh, people that take care of the galley. Um, so those are more permanent. So typically the, the crew will stay on for, for many, many months at a time. Um, some are somewhat permanent, but yeah, so uh, about 33 or so are, 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 are swapped out on a monthly or so basis as, as crews uh, uh, change. Great, thanks, good to, good to know. I think I saw one more question or... Uh... Yeah, uh, there's one more question in the box here. Will Mesobot collect data on metabolism and energetics and carbon slash nutrient processes? That's a, a very good question. So Mesobot has uh, yeah, a whole suite of different things. So it has you know, cameras basically to collect video data. Uh, it is able to collect also water samples for, for eDNA. Uh, has radiometers, which are these very, very uh, light sensitive uh, light meters. Um, and, and that's a big part of it. Uh, and then they've, they've stuck out a whole bunch of other sensors on there basically to get CTD and other environmental data. Um, in, in terms of metabolics, um, I'm not aware of, of that being a, a focus of, of this mission, uh, but it's, it's gearing towards that. Um, and, and a big focus really on, on this mission will be to uh, fine tune what we did last year, uh, where we did basically two things. Uh, one was to use the, the mesobot really to mimic what a lot of these organisms in the water column do, and that is to undergo dial vertical migrations. So in the thousand, top thousand meters of the water column, a lot of organisms uh, undergo this shift where they basically go up and down the water column as it gets darker and lighter, uh, and they're following isolooms, so areas of, of constant uh, light levels. Um, and basically we were, uh, or the team, the Woods Hole Oceanographic team has been, done tremendous job to basically uh, integrate different sensors to basically have Mesobot uh, be able to follow isolooms, much like many of these vertebrating um, organisms do. Uh, and so they're fine tuning that, um, and then a big part of it was, was just to understand what's in the water column. Uh, and that's both in terms of collecting video data as well as in environmental data for, for eDNA analysis. Um, so uh, I, I think the, the, the basic questions is, is really of, of what's out there and, and where, where they are and how they're behaving. Those are in terms of like broad strokes, what, what the, the main questions will be. Okay, we've got a bunch more questions coming in here soon. Um, does the NOAA Corps run the ship or is it run by other people? Yeah, excellent question. So this is, uh, it, it is, while well, we're very lucky to have co collaborated and worked with NOAA for, for many years now and a lot of our funding through the Ocean Exploration Cooperative uh, Institute, this is not a NOAA ship. Uh, so the NOAA Corps does not run the ship. We have a, a, a different company that, that runs the, the, the crew currently. Um, but uh, we still work very closely with NOAA. So NOAA folks sail. We've had several NOAA Corps officers sail last year uh, with us and, and uh, hopefully we'll have several join us again this year. Um, so yeah, it's not a NOAA ship, but we work very, very closely with different line offices within NOAA. Thanks. Uh, do you have any folks collecting marine mammal data while en route? Yeah, excellent qu question. So, you now as part of our just best management practices, uh, you know, keeping an eye on marine mammals is a, is a is an important part. 
mostly to avoid any potential um, impacts on marine mammals and other sensitive marine life. Uh, so yeah, our, our, our folks on the bridge do keep an eye on it uh, and keep mostly basically when there's uh, marine mammals or, or other large animals at the surface. Um, and, and that's a, a mandate for, for our mapping operations that we, we do not map when there's large animals in our vicinity. Um, and so, yeah, we, we have around the clock uh, folks on the bridge uh, looking out for, for what's around the ship. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Um, there's a follow-up question on the eDNA uh, sampling, and I guess wondering whether or not we also measure eRNA to see what's actually being transcribed at those times in DVM. Yeah, excellent question. I I I'll, I I'll, I don't think that's currently a part, and and I should mention that eDNA is is part of th uh, three different pieces. So we'll we'll be collecting eDNA both with Mesobot. We'll also be collecting uh, eDNA samples on ROV Hercules, on the Deep Autonomous Profiler, uh, and actually also on the Hadal Profiler. Um, so these are all different teams uh, that are. Uh, collecting the data and processing the data. Uh, so I'm not aware of, of exactly how they process in it and if they're also working on RNA. Um, but yeah, the uh, different tools and different objectives, and, and I'm sure that's something that's on their mind for, for future explorations. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Um, we'll have the next one be the final question. Um, so someone who has been on four cruises says the meals are typically amazing on these cruises. Uh, what's the best meal you've had out at sea, Daniel? <laughs> Excellent question. I mean, I'm just always amazed by uh, how good it is throughout, as the person here alludes to. And, and, and yeah, I'm always so thankful for, uh, for the hard work that the people on board do to, to keep us all fed and, and, and nourished. Um, if I had to say uh, the best meal is probably one of the times where we had you know, uh, uh, fresh fish. But yeah, I, I, I think the flip side of this is I have not yet had a bad meal on a Nautilus. And so I'm really thankful for that. Thanks. One of the team members who's Italian apparently does a nice pasta out at sea, handmade, handmade pasta. So. Um, maybe sometime Lee will go out and make us all a nice meal. Um, okay, I think that's the last of our time here. Um, so any follow-up questions, we'll be sure to address by email and feel free to reach out at da to Daniel at science at oet.org. I want to thank all of you for attending, whether you're watching live or recorded. Uh, we're really excited about the upcoming Ocean Exploration Trust season and um, look forward to following along with all of the exploration that you do. Thanks again, Daniel. We really appreciate it. Thanks so much.